This is Matthew Dennison, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. Hey, man, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking about your fantastic book. Uh, this thing's big, <laughs> like 500 pages or something. And it talks about the life of the queen, obviously the queen of England. Uh, I'm interested. There's been so much written about her. Why Why a new book? What What space was left to fill? Um, what I really wanted to do was reach the kind of assessment of the Queen as a practitioner of monarchy. And yes, there have been a lot of books about the Queen, but there have been a lot of the kind of books that tell you the things of the corgis that don't necessarily get to grips with what's really going on. So, so I was hoping that at this point in the reign, as we approach the 70th anniversary of the next session, which is obviously um, a, a landmark, but also a record in Great Britain, that, that this might be a time to take a long view and a long assessment of exactly what the Queen had done over the course of her reign. I know queens and kings are supposed to rule for life, but at some point, you're in your 90s, you know, even if you are have vim and vigor, it's remarkable if you do, but is it time at some point for, and I'm not saying this queen, but any monarch to step down and say, it's just, you know, the, my nation needs more out of what I, the, more than I can provide with my age. I mean, I'm not, again, not saying that for this one, but in general, can you outlive your usefulness and relevance in the, in the monarchy world? Um, well, of course, that has happened in the monarchies continental Europe. Um, uh, I think that's the only way she would um, uh, abdicate is if she had a stroke or suffered from Alzheimer's disease. So in some way was, was both mentally and physically incapacitated. And, and here is the deal. Elizabeth II is, I think, the only anointed sovereign on earth that, that alone the British monarchy retains this quasi-medieval coronation service in which the, 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 the monarch um, makes a binding sovereign, in, a, a binding promise rather, in a God's presence. And and obviously, if you believe in God and you have a strong religious faith, as our Queen does, then a promise made to God for life is a promise for life. I, I think also what's key here is that, you know, what, what do the British people and the people of the Commonwealth look to the Queen for? Well, at this point in her reign, we don't look to her for energy. Though she seems capable of mustering the energy needed to do the things that she has to do, like her meeting, meeting with President Putin at the weekend. She symbolizes so much more past in British life than dynamic force, although in her extraordinary she is a dynamic force. So in her case, at the moment, we, there have been questions since, I think, the 30th anniversary of the extension in 1982, following the marriage of the Prince of Wales to Diana Spencer, about whether she would resign in favor, uh, advocating in favour of her son. I, I don't think there is a significant groundswell of British opinion um, in, in favour of the Queen stepping aside. And I think there is a wide understanding that she probably won't. And ultimately, I mean, I guess it's her decision, right? If she feels like she's able to contribute and uh, is reasonably healthy, she, you know, she she is sworn in for life. So uh, why not keep going? I think so. Although, you know, the only caveat I would add to that is that what has she done and had at the forefront of her thoughts? Well, this idea that she is a kind of guardian of Monica, this safeguarder of the crowd. So I think if she thought her aid was somehow jeopardized, security of the throne. At that point, I think she she, she would step aside. But you know, the, the British love an old trooper. We love people who go on and on. So so, so there is no need on, on grounds of age for her to step aside. Yeah. She's lived for so long and reigned for so long. I mean, it's generations. It's And it's just outside of the norms of history. Yes, there are other people that have, have ruled for a very, very long time. But in the modern time, she's experienced quite a, an advancement. Air travel has completely changed. Now we have space travel, which is apparently becoming, you know, so routine that we're going to have moon bases maybe in her lifetime, you know, and, and she's in her 90s. It's, uh, it's remarkable that she's been as resilient and, and capable of remaining relevant uh, given all, I mean, the Internet phones and everything we're talking internationally over a computer none of this stuff was even possible even 30 years ago you know i guess there's a number of things going on um you know 
in the late 1960s in Britain, people began to say that the Queen, who, who hadn't markedly shift, shifted with the seismic social changes of the 1960s, could at this point become a, a, a symbol of, of, of continuity and endurance. And, and that which was probably seen as a bad thing in the late 1960s and the early 60s became a positive in that turbulent decade and has been a positive ever since. It is the case that um, monarchy has evolved during the Queen's very long reign, but evolved, I think, imperceptibly. Um, you know, undoubtedly, if courtiers from the beginning of the reign came, came back, one would think there had been a considerable lessening of formality, that there was greater accessibility, that connections between crown and country were greater. But, but most people haven't really noticed the changes. And, and I guess, you know, why is the Queen relevant? Because she continues to embody values the nation endorses most of us in practice those values uh, in, to nearly the same extent that she does. It also seems like she has a, an ability to adapt with the times. It may not be as fast as people in the press or the, or the populace wants, but she's able to. I remember when uh, when um, uh, Princess Diana died and it was, you know, is the flag going to fly at half mast? And it, it took a while to get that sorted out. But, but now it's that's sort of forgiven because she does make these leaps ahead. She does progress into what is a, a more socially tolerant time, I suppose you would say. Uh, and, and that, I think, is to her credit. But she has to move as fast as the crown can let it. And this is an American asking kind of a question. The crown moves at a different speed than other things do. So how does she, as the crown, meter how fast she moves on certain issues or, or, or um, advancements? Well, I guess the question that she would continually ask is, you know, what change is necessary? Um, the, the, the crown is not fashion. Um, you know, in, in, in Britain, um, fashion hasn't been set by the monarchy for 300 years. The point about fashion is that fashions change and you're always in danger of being left behind if you are a in a particular fashion. Um, monarchy needs to be timeless. It's the significant difference between a royal and a celebrity. A celebrity is a person of intense interest to the public for a short period of their lives, and then the public lose interest. It's absolutely key that the public retain lifelong interest in members of the royal family because the role is a lifelong one. So my feeling is that, that, that in the same way that the Queen is above politics, she's slightly above fashion, you know, it is no longer the case that in Britain people look at the Queen and necessarily see themselves reflected. People don't dress like the Queen, they don't speak like the Queen, but they do see a reflection of very positive Britishness in her. Um, and, and I think across the Commonwealth, those nations that retain the Queen as head of state recognise her kind of deep affection for those nations and, and the sense in which she, she, she always does her best to put them first. What does someone like the Queen do with uh, with their life in general? I mean, do they does she set goals? Is she trying to accomplish like things? I mean, obviously she's got a, a busy day to day life, but how does she look ahead? You know, five year plan or whatever it's going to be. How do we? How does she even process that with uh, with all that she already does? Well, of course, her working life involves looking ahead because her, her diary is months, months, and sometimes years in advance. Um. She made a visit to a, a newly independent African state in the early 1960s and wrote a letter to a Greek friend saying that she was astonished by the, the outlook of the new president of this new nation in that he didn't look beyond his own lifetime. And, and the Queen, who of course you know, sees herself in this long continuum as the 41st English sovereign since the Norman Conquest, doesn't have the option of only seeing things in terms of her lifetime. So I think throughout her reign, there's been this double perspective, a, a, a focus on doing the day-to-day -day job to the best of her ability, and also enjoying it, which I must say that she tries to enjoy every single day, but, but also an innate understanding that this is more than one person's life job. You know, that, that this, is, this is the continuity of a, of a millennium old system of government in this country. Uh, that's interesting. And I guess the same kind of question, you know, for, for Prince Charles, because he's been waiting, you know, to, to do whatever it is he's going to do. And so your life is sort of always in limbo, right? And you have to try to decide what kind of person you are. And I don't know how much of a mentor the Queen is to him, if that's even appropriate or anything, but, you know, 
how does he manage that? And how does she manage that? Because it's hard to be, you can't just be a mom because you're also the crown. You're also the boss and everything else. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of things going on here. Um, one is that, that there is a popular idea that the Prince of Wales must be a deep, frustrated man because he is in his early 70s still waiting for yeah. his wife's work. But, but of course, he's made his wife's work for a sizable chunk of it as Prince of Wales. And I, I don't think it is an unfulfilled life. No Prince of Wales in British history has done as much positive good for the nation as this Prince of Wales. And he's had a degree of freedom to manoeuvre that he won't have when the top job comes his way. Um, in, in terms of the Queen mentoring, it, it is very clear that the Queen regards herself as a monarch in the mould of her father and her grandfather. And really until quite late in her reign, even in the early 1990s, she was referencing her father's example, although fewer, fewer and fewer of them remembered her father's example. And, and key to the example of her father and her grandfather was the fear of um, what constitutional historians now call a welfare monarchy. So, so a monarchy that is at the center of a philanthropic um, endeavor in Britain. And obviously the key concepts there are duty and service. And you know, what, what would the queen argue she'd pass on to her children while well, doing service? And, and actually the astonishing work carried out by the Prince of Wales and the Princess Royal would suggest that yeah, they have absolutely taken that on board. So that there is clear continuity to more than I think journalists sometimes are. And I suppose that leads to the, the question of if, let's say the Queen has another 10 years in her, does at some point, does Charles just say, it's just not fair to the people to have this double transition because I might be too old soon? I mean, is there a scenario, is there a reasonable scenario where he just steps aside and, and lets his son take over? Um, well, of course, that would be up to him. Um, you know, abdication is a heavily charged word in the British monarchy because, um, you know, the Queen has not forgotten the abdication that brought her own father to the throne and uh, and the very significant um, wobble that the institution had at that particular moment. It is also the case that for a hereditary monarchy where um, uh, eligibility um, to, to, to be sovereign is based on primogeniture. It's dangerous to challenge that principle from within. So I think if as a member of royal royal family, you suggest that there can be choice in the business, that, that, that's a dangerous street to go down because if you can choose, then perhaps other people can choose. And if they choose, they might not choose you. Um, so I, I don't know is the answer. Obviously it would be Prince Charles's choice. It would require an act of parliament to require Prince William's consent. Um, who knows? But 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 in British history before now, we've had this pattern of wrong reign. And then I guess the other example would be, you know, when in the late seventies, early eighties, when we had three popes in fast succession because Pope John Paul the first passed away. I don't know, not even three months in. You know, how does the uh, how does the crown? And we don't want to wish ill on anybody, but if a similar scenario plays out. Is that equally as damaging as someone, you know, saying, "Hey, abdicating along the way"? Or is, I mean, how does how does how does the country, the nation, the monarch, the monarchy in general, how do they tolerate something like that if there was a lot of catastrophic change? Well, I guess we haven't had that, have we, um, in, in, in British history? But you know, the, the deal with the British monarchy is: is the king is dead, long live the king. Yeah. Right. The, the crown never dies, which is why the Queen resisted the lowering of the royal standard of the palace after the death of the Princess of Wales, um, because the standard hadn't been lowered for her father, and she didn't anticipate it being lowered for her because because the crown remains alive. So obviously, it would be you know it, it would be a period of upheaval. Having said that, I think if what we're talking about is elderly people dying, then that's not traumatic. It can be upsetting, but it, but it, but, but it, but it's not traumatic, is it? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 until it is right. Like it's not in theory, but yeah, you never know. And then what about, you know, when you, when you're the head of state, you go through a lot of uh, catastrophes, you know, through the years, whether it's uh, we had nine 11 and that's, that shakes the foundation of the nation. Um, a tragedy like uh, Abervan, you know, when the uh, when the coal cones collapse, is is someone in their nineties capable of rising to the occasion for something as calamitous as that? That might require some 
you know, physical effort, staying. I mean, you think about the coronavirus stuff, and obviously that's not her main job, but remember our governor here was hoarse, and you could see he was just exhausted from just trying to deal with this impossible thing. Is that something that she just puts off on somebody else who has more capacity? You know, because she's got a whole family. You know, it's like lean on, hey, Charles, I need you to cover this for me. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess here's the deal. Remember, that what the Queen doesn't have is power. She doesn't have power right. like any kind of political representative. The, the point at moments of crisis is for the Queen to be a, a, a sort of conduit for, for national emotion. And in, in terms of the coronavirus, well, what did she do? Well, her coronavirus broadcast attracted to 24 million viewers, which is a, you know, a huge viewing figure for British telly. It, for example, is a million more people that tuned in, than tuned into Diana's Panorama interview that, that was said to have broken all, you know, so many records. So um, because the Queen has moral authority, because she commands extraordinary respect, because there is this kind of bedrock of, of deep affection for her, um, you know, what, what she does at moments like that is to be a kind of mouthpiece, but also to be a voice of reassurance. And, and what did she do in the coronavirus? She gave people reassurance. And it was doubly effective because she's one of a dwindling number of survivors of the, of the, of the wartime generation. And although the Queen didn't make a connection with the war, there was a lot of talk at the time that here we were entering something that resembled a blitz-like scenario. And so I think to have somebody from this rather tough, gritty, ramrod-backed generation, of whom we have fewer survivors, was potent in itself, but also somebody who actually rose to the occasion. It was one of the great speeches of her reign, and it, and it absolutely did the business, and it was then projected on huge billboards on an empty Piccadilly Circus at the centre of London. Um, so, so she still got it, you know. Um, yeah, and and I I, I want to kind of close out this section of the show talking about the current queen and the future and all that kind of thing. But I, I definitely want to get into, and it's one of the fascinating things you've written about, is the um, she had three basic confidants: her mom, her sister, and her husband. And now now they're all passed. And then you also talked about how you know she used her dad as an example. I think a few minutes ago you said this as well, uh, all the way into the nineties. But now there's really no one on earth more qualified to do her job than her. doesn't mean that she can't take advice on certain issues, but she is the job now. I mean, she is the example. She's done it longer than anybody. So when you look at all of this, how does that being alone impact her? Or is she ever truly alone? And who does she confide in? And who can she get counsel from on the hard things? Um, well, of course, you know, what we factor into here is, is that sovereignty is isolating. She has been isolated by dint of her position from 1952. And at the end of the day, even her mother, her husband and her sister at some level treated her as the queen. Um, a key facet of the queen's upbringing was self-control. And, you know, at the time in interwar Britain, among uh, aristocratic and upper class um, family self-control, you know, what is sometimes described as stiff upper lip, was considered a cardinal virtue, that, 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 that total um, a grip on your feelings and responses. And although that is not fashionable nowadays as an approach to life and certainly not as a kind of emotional solution, it is a very effective solution to, 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 to being in this position where it, it is virtually impossible to confide fully in anyone. Having said that, um, th there is so much evidence to say that Queen, who is personally a very modest person, will take guidance. You know, she takes guidance from her, her, her prime ministers, from her, from her private secretaries, from her courtiers. Does she take guidance on what it means to be the Queen? Well, she doesn't need guidance on what it means to be the, the Queen because she has been the queen through seven decades and, and you know, has an innate understanding of the business of monarchy handed down to her from her formidable grandparents and, and, and her slightly cuddlier parents. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, when you say 70 years, it's kind of, it's mind boggling. You know, it's not kind of, it's completely mind boggling. I mean, she did go through World War II, she watched her dad, and then she became, she became this figure that is largely not in control of her own life. There's a lot of things she just can't, she has no 
no normalcy in her life. I mean, obviously she does what she does to take care of her family and everything, but it is a pretty interesting position to be in for so long. Not allowed to retire, really. You know, it's it's uh, maintaining a social calendar. You know, people talk about their grandparents like, oh, look, they're so adorable. They go out and they play pinochle with their friends and bridge. And uh, she doesn't get to be that lady ever. You know, it, it's, uh, it is a lifelong, and it sounds like she's a hardworking lady. How many hours a week do you think she works? Well, of course, she, 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 but then there's also, so she's government papers every day when Parliament is sitting. Um, she receives paperwork that, for example, the Prime Minister doesn't receive because she receives paperwork from the Governors General across the Commonwealth. Um, so, you know, she is effectively working, it's not requirement. Um, having said that, it is the only life she knows and has ever known. Her entire life has been lived within palace walls. She, she doesn't have experience of what we might call everyday life. You know, at the 30th anniversary, a newspaper commented that her life had been blessed with every privilege apart from privacy. And, and yeah. I guess simply something that she's used to. What would you say? I mean, you've done the uh, done the work to look into her life, and I'm curious about your point of view and what you think her answer would be. What moments are, is she most proud of? And and when you look at your queen and you say, this is when she was the most queeniest and and really so impressive. Um, I, I don't know what she would say, and I don't think she's somebody who is in the business of giving herself pats on the back. What she says that she particularly values are her palace investitures. Um, we have what's called an honor system in Britain where people are given awards and, and the awards the awards were instituted essentially for voluntary work. So, for example, somebody who had been a postman in a rural area you know, for 40 years and all have gone up and down a mountain delivering letters or people who've worked for St. John Ambulance have done voluntary work in hospital, that kind of thing. The, the Queen regards that as one of the most important things that she does, that delivering of pats on backs to other people those people who have made a positive contribution to community, because, because the Queen is keen on community and social cohesion. Um, I, I don't know if she, she has done things, but there must be moments when she has given a speech, there must be moments when a banquet has gone well, when a diplomatic reception has gone well, when the reception of an ambassador, when, when, when an overseas tour has gone well. Um, you know, there have been diplomatic triumphs when when the Queen's intervention appears to have turned things around. I guess what she would presumably consider one of her great achievements is the nurturing and, and, and binding together, but also huge scale growth of the Commonwealth. You know, that, that, that agglomeration of 54 nations scattered across the world that in, in many cases are, are remnants of empire. But, but unlike empire, it's a voluntary coming together. And, and really, so many of those countries didn't need to be part of this. But yet, it now represents a quarter of the world's population. And they clearly see positive benefits in it. And my understanding is the fact that they have chosen the Prince of Wales to succeed the Queen, though the title of head of the Commonwealth is not hereditary, is a kind of ultimate endorsement of a, a pretty unflagging efforts on the Commonwealth's behalf. One of the problems we have here in the United States is uh, our leaders, you know, the hallmarks of a great states person, you know, building consensus, having a moral compass, all these things. We are terrible here, and, and maybe by design, we are terrible at consensus, right? And so our leaders will say, I'm going to build consensus. And then the next thing you know, they're like, I've got a mandate to change everything. <laughs> Everybody loses their mind. And I suppose on the, uh, on the parliamentary side, that's probably largely true for you guys, but why is the queen so magnetic? I mean, look, we love her here too. We don't want her on the wall of our bank and everything like that, but we are in absolutely obsessed with the queen, the royals, and all that stuff. How does she manage to build this consensus? I mean, 70 years at she's been doing the job, but you can be you can be a non-consensus builder for 70 years. What is yeah. she? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, un, unlike a politician, she has no agenda for crafting change. Um, you know, um, ch ch change I I in royal terms needs to be invisible so that they can remain the still point at the center of the vortex. It's also the case that that the queen has has been oyster-like in terms of expressing personal opinions. If you don't express opinions, then you don't offend people. 
And, and, and part of what she has done is, is this avoiding of giving offence, because then she can be a queen for everybody, because your British society is, is transformed in 2021 from what it was like in 1952. We are now a multi-ethnic, multi-faith, uh, multilingual society, which we emphatically weren't to, to nearly that degree 70 years ago. And it is very difficult for one elderly woman to embody a concept of nationhood for so diverse a society. But, but one way the Queen has done that is by obviously seeming interested in everybody, not prioritising any sector of British society or another, um, and also um, clearly valuing cohesion. You know, we don't know what the real nature of the relationship with Mrs Thatcher was in the 1980s, but, but the line was always that Mrs Thatcher's very combative approach to politics was at odds with the Queen's approach. The Queen's approach is to boil on trouble. Mrs Thatcher liked nothing more than a fight and a row. Um, but I think, you know, we appreciate that the Queen actually represents tranquility. Um, why do people look at her across the globe? Well, because she is, um, she is untarnished goods. You know, the image of the Queen on the British in 1967 by a sculptor called Arnold Machin is the most reproduced work of art in, in, in human history. And yet, despite the fact that she is the most famous woman on the globe, at some level, she is also the least known because we have very, very little idea of what's going on inside her head, apart from the fact she likes racing and corgis. Um, but of course, that untouchable quality you know, it's extraordinary in, in, in an age of the internet and social media that, that she remains remote in a very good way. You, you know, I was astonished, for example, when President Trump used tweet, used Twitter as a political platform. That seemed to me extraordinary that you would shrink political rhetoric to 140 characters. And you, you can't imagine the Queen resorting to that sort of thing, apart from for the most anodyne comment about some aspect of good works. So I think the fact that she she doesn't expose herself um, therefore means that the currency stays high. And there is a kind of specialness in this untouched, um, unknown quality. I got to swap my battery out here. I'm going to do this while we're talking. My uh, my question to you then is, uh, I want to kind of come back to this in another way. You are such a diverse commonwealth. So many different countries electing to come in. But the diversity thing, you know, diversity is the opposite of unity, right? And so it's the same kind of question, but how do you create something that is so diverse and yet can be so British, be so singular, be so unified. And that, that's a definitely a dance that we're not good at here. We'd rather just fight and yell at each other and, and call each other names, you know. So the unity versus diversity thing uh, over the last seventy years. How do you? How do you? Uh, what you what's your opinion on that? Do, do you mean in British life or in the Commonwealth? Well, in the Commonwealth. Well, I, I guess the key to the Commonwealth. When the Commonwealth first evolved, it was referred to as the British Commonwealth. And then the word British was dropped from it. And um, I, I guess you can be different. There can be diversity, but there can be shared aims. And, and the, the overriding Commonwealth aim of, of, of wanting to create a, a better world for world citizens, but, but also that, that, that kind of sense that um, the, the richer nations on earth will do their best to help the poorer nations on earth. But that seems to be a universal aspiration. I think key to the Commonwealth is that, is that although there have clearly been times when British politicians and perhaps the Queen herself have rather hoped that some countries that were once imperial positions would join the Commonwealth, um, jo joining has always been voluntary. So it's, it's always been an element of consensus. Now, that doesn't mean there have been deep divisions. There were deep divisions about apartheid in South Africa, for example, and the and, and, and British government in the 1980s decision not to impose sanctions on South Africa when Black African nations did that. So there have been moments when the Commonwealth has reached crisis point and the, 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 the bonds of union have seemed very fragile indeed. But, but I think what holds it together now? Well, the sense that there is shared purpose, that this kind of coming together can make a better world, should make a better world. I, I think there is an element also that shared respect and affection for the Queen is also a kind of glue in the Commonwealth. Um, 
you know. And the, I'm curious, what um, what would you say of our relationship between you know the Great Britain as a whole and then the United States? I mean, we we tend to pick fights, and we're like we're like your drunken brother, <laughs> like hey, we're gonna go fight all of Iraq, all of the Middle East. Will you come with us? You know, and we co-opt Canada and New Zealand and Australia. You know, all of our cousins and everything. We all go over and do that. Are we are we a good partner? Or are we kind of a pain in the ass? Um, but obviously, I couldn't possibly comment. Um, no, I, 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 I don't know what America is. It certainly is the case that in Britain, the idea of the special relationship is not simply something that politicians utter once in a while. I think we do have a sense that there is a special relationship between Britain and America. Whilst well, recognizing that, that we are in many ways um, very different countries with very different outlooks. Um, it's a difficult juggling act for British politicians because when there is a sense that Britain is becoming a kind of poodle to the United States, then there is considerable unhappiness in Britain. And it, certainly when Tony Blair was prime minister, uh, there was a lot of adverse comment about the extent to which he appeared to jump when 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 the USA snapped its fingers. And so certainly in, in, in Britain, we would consider that it is a special relationship, but one that should be characterized by mutual respect and mutual independence. And that was a key bit, it seems to me, in the film Love Actually, was the film that, 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 that Hugh Grant gave as prime minister when he, when he said that it mustn't be a bullying relationship despite the disparity in power. And then how does the queen deal with these things? I mean, she's seen so much now. I mean, been through all these different prime ministers and obviously her power in this case is, is limited, but her influence is powerful. So when she looks at this, I mean, she's just along for the ride or how does she, I mean, look, if, if you're a prime minister and you're not taking some mentoring lessons from the lady, um, you're, you're crazy because she knows so much about this. She's seen it all, you know? I, I guess again, it's that long-term view, isn't it? That, you know, yeah. prime ministers, presidents, um, they they all come and go. Archbishops of Canterbury, they come in, they, they go out. And um, there are numerous instances in, in the history of the Queen's reign where perhaps the prime minister has come into office and felt they just know best, and 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 the, and the Queen is a kind of quaint sideshow, uh, and there's an idea of just paying lip service. And then I think they come to value the nature of their own personal relationship with her. But but also, you know, they get reminded of the importance of, the, of, of, of crown power as part of executive power in Britain. That, you know, the crown is a key um, stopping device in, in British politics. In, it, it, you know, it, it, in theory, it acts as a force for moderation. Um, it, it prevents any one person gaining too much power. It prevents... A, a military coup, it, it prevents the overthrow of democracy, all of those sort of things. And I, th I think people recognize and value that. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Is there any value in the fact that the U.S. has such a big military machine that, that you guys can spend less money on military stuff? Or do you all still fight about how much? I mean, we, we can never decide how much we want to spend. We just always want to spend more, right? And so you don't have to have a massive Navy. We'll do it for you, right? Like we have this crazy, uh, again, drunken brother spending habit. But do you guys feel like that's a benefit to you to be allied with us because we have so much material or is that not really a benefit for you? I, I, I truthfully don't remember that being a significant factor in in these discussions in this country. Um in recent decades, we've had ongoing and continuous defence budget cuts in Britain, which consistently make people nervous. And I think um, whatever our relationship with Europe, whether we were part of the European Union, or of course now we're not part of the European Union, that there is an aspect of Britishness, which is identity as an island state. And, and as an island state, you feel both vulnerable, because you are you have frontiers on all sides, but also you, you feel slightly impregnable because there is a sea around you. So I, I think it is a kind of a, a constant discussion in, in British political life how much should be spent on the defence budget. Um, presumably because at key moments we can't afford everything that we would like to do. Um, but but I but I'm not aware that um, I, I don't think we say well that's fine because we'll rely on the states to bail us out. Um, because of course history so often doesn't work like that and. You know, 
gosh, we are grateful for the help that we received from the states in the Second World War, but also we recognize that public opinion in the states was not 100% behind joining that conflict. And so why would it be necessarily in the future? Yeah, that's, that's that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Okay, enough about that stuff. I want to ask you more about the writing the book itself. By the way, we're talking to Matthew Dennison, who wrote an incredible book called The Queen. If you look at the bottom of the page here, if on the video side, you'll be able to see the link. And if you're on the podcast side, just read, look in the show notes and you'll be able to get it. It's a, it's a 500 page book, so it's thorough. But what part of the book was the most fun for you to write? Or is, is writing a book a slide? I mean, I know authors who are like iron butters who sit down for 16 hours and just write, go to bed, wake up, Iron butted again for 16 hours. What kind of writer are you and what part was the most enjoyable to write about? Okay, so I also do that. I start at nine in the morning and I finish at 1.30, 2 o'clock the next morning. And uh -huh. I take an hour off for lunch and then I take three hours off, drink time at six in the evening and then to supper and then I start working at nine in the evening again. And by the time I finish, my back aches, my head aches, my eyes ache, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm close to divorce. Um, <laughs> and, and the, yeah, um, Having said that, 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 there is much that is so rewarding along the way. And th this is my ninth book. And unquestionably, this was the most daunting prospect, partly because she is the best known woman in the world. She's the best been written about her. It's a whoppingly long life. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it, I found it a terrifying prospect, but, but exhilarating <laughs> at other moments. But yeah, frightening. What did I enjoy writing about? I loved, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I explored her childhood in real depth because I found the childhood charming and wonderful and surprising. Um, the, there wasn't an aspect I didn't enjoy except perhaps chronicling um, the kind of difficult years of marital breakdown in, in the case of her children and, and, and then the hard times in the night. Yeah, that's also another era that kind of got ushered in that um, we're just going to grip on and go on and stay married. That sort of uh, stopped during her uh, her reign. That had to be a lot to carry around. And then to try to define what, what the crown does about that when your family is breaking up and, uh, you know, all this salaciousness. And then having the press covering this salaciousness and making all their money on salacious stories. They don't make their money on, hey, so-and-so got an A on their English paper. You know, <laughs> like they make the money on the... Uh, on the exciting stuff. Yeah, how how does she how does she deal with that? With like all of the negative aspects of I remember when Alec Baldwin was married to Kim Bassinger, he he said some really horrible things to his daughter on the answering machine, right? And if and if we all had the worst things we ever said to our kid recorded and played for the entire world, we would be like, ah, but but it also is like we all say things that we're like we regret to our kids because we're humans, you know? Yeah, I mean it, the, the Queen um, began her inheriting this 19th century concept that um, somehow the royal family was meant to be exemplary in every way, which is a, an idea that Victoria and Albert had worked on so hard, mostly to kind of banish the spectre of Queen Victoria's really very dodgy uncles, um, most of whom, um, you know, had long-term mistresses, uh, significant numbers of illegitimate children, and, and lived lives of, of kind of drunken, drunken fun. Um, and Prince Albert thought that simply wasn't good enough, particularly in the aftermath of the French Revolution. So, so he crafted this concept of monarchy where, where you had a kind of idealized family on the throne. And of course, that was incredibly effective for Victoria and her family. And so subsequent generations inherited it. And it only really begins to splinter with, with the divorce of Princess Margaret in the late 1970s, then followed by the divorce of the Queen's children. Um, I mean, the good thing for the monarchy as an institution and us as a nation is that we seem to have reached much more tranquil waters. And I think with hindsight, there are a great many people in Britain who are um, horrified by the way the press behaved during that difficult decade, because um, there was just a, an extraordinary, disreputable and vulgar scurrilousness to it. And very few people's lives will bear that degree of scrutiny, particularly if you add into this phone hacking and eavesdropping and et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, gosh, aren't we lucky that the Queen herself emerged um, untainted? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and I'm glad that there is someone untainted in this uh, horribly tainted world that we all live in. I want to go back into the book a little bit because if you're going to write a, a 
first off, 500 pages, probably not even enough to cover a lady who's 90 years old, who's been as important as she has for as long. She, that's not even a hundred pages per decade. You know, I mean, it's like, it's all of a sudden it's not very much, but how much resourcing did you have to do? And then there must be so much competing thought on certain events or certain stories. And he said, she said times 70 years, how on earth do you sort all that out? So somewhere along the line, you have to take an editing decision because the, this book, the book was commissioned was meant to be um, at least kind of 60 or 70 pages shorter than it is. By the same token, it could also have been 300 pages longer very easily. Um, I, I guess the point was that I wanted to have this kind of overarching narrative, this idea of, of, of you know, where, where we were going and what the significance of all of this is for Monkey. And, and, and not necessarily, it's necessarily what Queen is saying when she hands, um, you know, a gong to somebody as what this actually contributes to a kind of template of monarchy. Um, there are conflicting views. Somewhere along the line, one has to reach a decision. It's kind of what you want to do as, a, as, a, as an author. And the, the only critical thing is that you ensure that you reach your decision with integrity. I think um, this is my fourth royal biography. Writing about royals is different from writing about other people because people remember their encounters with, with royals um, unreliably. Um, invariably, when somebody meets a member of the royal family, particularly the queen, they're in a highly excitable state. You know, they're deeply revved up by this. And so they don't behave normally. She, of course, is used to it, so she can behave normally. But, but for the person meeting the queen, it tends to be a once in a lifetime extraordinary encounter that they remember for years and it becomes a kind of dinner table um, conversation or, or lunch party conversation they dine out on and it gets polished and polished and, and, and the kernel of truth somehow gets lost in all of this or the memories are very extreme you know people either bowled over or massively underwhelmed so don't get a kind of control experiment anywhere so you have to kind of navigate through the views you're given you still have to I, I think as a writer on royal things recognize that Sometimes the people who want to speak to you and who want to suggest that they know the most are not as close to the center of power as they want you to think they are. And the people who really are royal confidants wouldn't dream of talking to you, mm. which is why they're royal confidants. <clears throat> yeah, hence the title. Yeah. I don't know if you know uh, Robert Caro's work, but he's written a multi-volume uh, biography of Lyndon Baines Johnson, one of our presidents here in the United States. Yes, the only one I've ever met. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, how lucky is that? And then you know, his he was taught to every single piece of paper deserves his attention, and he just goes through the entire archives, and I mean the entire thing is like this is his, going to be his life's work. Does is someone out there who's going to do that for the queen, where they're just going to leaf by leaf, note by note, go through the entire thing and make a, a I don't know <laughs> that would be like a twenty volume set, but is there someone out there that needs to do that, or or is that done already because there have been so many books about about who the lady is and how long she's been around. When the, after the Queen dies, um, then the, the palace will commission what's called an official biography. And um, who those appointed to write that book will be given access to the Queen's own papers. And nobody in the Queen's life will gain access to those papers. And, um, you know, if I were in that position, then I would feel, yes, you know, one is obliged to read everything unless it becomes quickly apparent that something is simply a duplication of something else but but i guess that's the legwork that's needed to put in because when you you know when, when you write nonfiction, there's just always a chance that somebody has scribbled something on the back of a menu there's a postcard that you find there's some diary entry that perhaps is atypical suddenly illuminates something when i was writing my very first book about the youngest daughter of Queen Victoria, I had this very powerful sense of what it was up, but I had no proof for it. And then suddenly, in a small auction house, I found a series of letters written by a, a housemaid employed by the exiled Empress Eugenie of France, the, the widow of Napoleon III, which said exactly what I had thought all along. But I so easily might not have looked through that catalogue, might never have found those letters. So, it, there is gold dust around the corner, potentially always, always, because that's your eureka moment. And, and, and as a biographer, that's what you want. That's part of the excitement. 
there's literally a guy in New York City who he is a miner, and that's no, there's no better term for it. He goes around and he combs the cracks of the sidewalks, and you know, as people's jewelry falls apart, as stones fall out, he gathers all of this wealth. Now it's not like a bazillion dollars, but there is literally money in the streets of New York City, you know, and and you have to comb through where no one wants, no one wants that job, but he yeah. does that and makes a living doing it. Well, I guess that's sort of what I'm doing, isn't it? Yeah, right, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so and this is what I'm gonna ask, is like, if you were commissioned to do this multi-volume set, what kind of commitment is that for you? Is that the last, is that the last project you take on the rest of your life? Does that take 25 years to do? I mean, to do that right. And then also, how do you do the analysis? I mean, this is a long, long life. You don't just put that in your head. Like you've got to annotate and like really, I mean, would you hire a team of analysts to start really putting this thing together so you can see the whole picture? Or how does that work, man? Well, I suppose everybody. Um, I mean, for me, this book took. Wow. So, so, yeah. An official level of the Queen's mother took um, nine years. But I think there was a, a, either a seven or a nine year gap between the Queen Mother's death and publication of, of William Shawcross's. Um, rather wonderful but very long book. Um, th the point also is you can't make it take too long because because people's appetite for the book goes. Um, you know, people have short memories, even even of the good in the world, people have short memories. And and so the, the appetite for an official life of the Queen will require that whoever is given that Herculean task um, do, do their very best to produce it within a time frame. Um, I, I, I don't use research assistants because, you know, we all interpret things differently. Interpretation is a subjective business, isn't it? Even if one is struggling to be as objective as possible. And I think it becomes a huge, sprawly octopus of a beast, obviously, writing this kind of book when you are just surrounded by, um, you know, tiring tar tar blocks of paper. But but I think somehow somebody has to be the chief player in order to take responsibility. Yeah, and then there's a hundred other ways to do this too, right? Like there might be the guy that hires the team. There's the guy that does that. He just feeds paper into the computer and spits out answers. Who knows, right? There's a lot of ways to do this thing. What uh, I mean, obviously, the, this book is out. You're promoting it now. But you must have your eye on the next next project because I don't know a single author who writes many books who's like I don't know what to do next. Like you know something next. What's what's next for you? I'm um, finishing a book about Roald Dahl, a children's author. You write about children's authors. You wrote about um, uh, Beatrix Potter, right? Yep, and Kenneth Graham, the man who wrote The Wind in the Willows. So, so for me, I have got into a pattern of writing a long book followed by a short book. These long books, like The Queen, require you know, a huge amount of stamina. And um, I am particularly interested in children's literature, children's literature that survived, you know, what prompts somebody to become a children's author, what, what is it that makes um, a, a children's book classic. And, and I'm very happy that, um, that my current editor likes this way of working that I do long, but then I have this, 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 this kind of slight holiday of, of doing yeah. these, these enjoyable short books. So, um, so Roald Dahl at the moment, actually, not nearly as far finished as I might have suggested. Um, but that's what I'm working on. And then is there a book about the Queen you would like to write if you were to write another one? Like, oh, it's the Queen and, you know, Harry Truman and their secret relationship via letters or whatever. You know, is there something out there that you would want to take on next? No, I mean, um, I, I potentially would like to write about the Queen at another point. I'd quite like to have a rest first. Um, yeah. And, and obviously there'd have to be some, there'd have to be some real, I think it would be self-indulgence on my part if there wasn't some kind of proper imperative, like the discovery of something that um, uh, reshaped or resculpted the story. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so maybe, maybe, I mean, never say never. Right, right. I, I guess uh, asking this question another way is, what ended up on the cutting room floor that, you know, in those 300 pages that, that kind of hurt to get rid of? Well, I, I don't write multiple drafts of my book. I rewrite as I go along. So, so by the time I type the end, I've probably written every sentence at least 12 times. Um, so, so there are stuff that is being, you know, rejected uh, along. Here's the deal. For me, 
if you write a book about the Queen, it is very easy for it to be a book about her family. It's very easy for it to be a book about British life. It's very easy for it to be a chronicle of four prime ministers. Uh, and so my aim always was to try and keep this slightly elusive figure that is the Queen centre stage and camera front. And so it, it, simply by pushing everybody else into the background as far as was reasonable without distorting the story was inevitably an editing process. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. And then what about the Queen did you learn about that shocked you? You're, you know, like these, these, I mean, I, I know a lot of authors and you guys all have these moments where like this all of a sudden came to me, maybe even after you've written the book, you know, cause you have these revelations that happen later on. But what did you learn about the queen that was most incredible? Um, I think what I learned was this overwhelming sense of fidelity to her immediate forebears. This, I think what I hadn't realized is the, the pressure on her from childhood to conform to an inherited pattern. And, and this idea once it became clear that she was likely to be a um, queen, that, that she would exercise no choice in the way that she went about it, that, that she would do the sensible thing, which was to model herself on her father and her grandfather. And I think it's an extraordinary thing that she accepted that curtailment of choice in a life that involves such limited freedom of choice anyway, that she embraced this overarching restriction of choice, which was to do it the way that was expected of her. Um, it's interesting for us, isn't it? Because we live at a time where choice is elevated as the ultimate yeah. human right. You know, there is nothing in our life which we don't feel we have, we have a right. Of choice. And yet the Queen has a very little right of choice. I think it probably helps that she is fundamentally a modest person. And so, you know, would incline, certainly as a young woman, would have inclined to take the advice that she was given and, and, and acknowledge that other people perhaps knew better. I, and I guess one more real quick question, and it's kind of a big question, but I just realized I have no idea. When her uncle abdicates, that changes her life completely. She was whatever life she was going to have, and you know, who knows, she was young enough that maybe it wasn't too mapped out, but it changes inexorably the moment he abdicates, right? And and she becomes this new thing, which is yeah. part not human, part crown, part little yeah. girl. Yeah. What was her life just the, the weeks before that, before that was even a notion that that might happen? What kind of what kind of person was she going to be when she grew up? Well, it's interesting. If if you look at um, any kind of account of her childhood, she emerges as this incredibly vibrant, fascinating child. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the fact that the Duke and Duchess of Windsor called her Shirley Temple, well, well, there is a reason for that. It's not only that she was globally famous as a small child in the way that she was as a screen actress. It, it, it's the fact that as a tiny child, she had this, this kind of glittering charisma. Mm. So what didn't change in the Queen's life is that she was a figure of significant interest, adulation, press obsession from the cradle because she was the only royal grandchild. So, so her, her, her aunt had given birth to two sons, but they, they were not royal um, because she had married a non-royal sister. So when the queen comes out, she's the only princess in her generation. So she's always a figure of astonishing interest. So, so the kind of goldfish for bowl dimension of her life doesn't change in 37. What changes is that suddenly she is treading a path from which there is no escape. Because I think there's always an understanding that her parents, who were young enough to have more children, probably wouldn't have any more children. Um, she did understand what it meant for her, it, insofar as any 10-year-old can. She knows that it means she will be the queen after her father. Of course, she has no idea really what that, what that implies or infers. So, um, I, I, but I suspect that was less traumatic for her than for her parents, because she could then be brought up to be the queen, whereas her father had been brought up to be the spare, not the heir. Yeah, yeah, that's a big transition for him, too. And I, I suppose if you're, if you're a religious person, like she, you know, she is, because she is the church, mm -hmm. you, you have to kind of look back and go, this is... This is providence. This is God's design. He built this little person equipped to handle this. And is that, or am I making too big of a leap there? I, I, I don't know to what extent she feels that. I mean, she, she certainly um, feels that her coronation vows are, are binding, are, are promise made to God. But, but, but what is interesting for us at this moment in time is that when the queen became queen in 1952, 
30% of people in Britain polled believed that it was God's will that she would. So a third of the population felt that yeah. this wasn't an accident, but was some kind of divine providence. And, and surely some of that would have rubbed off on her. I don't think she's egotistical enough to, 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 to you know, necessarily believe in herself the way that Stuart Monarch in the 17th century as divinely ordained. But yeah. I, I think she thinks she has made binding and sacred promises to do her best. I mean, it has worked out as if there was some kind of intelligent providential, you know, plan. Uh, but, but again, you know, who knows? Who knows? It, it's it, it is just interesting looking back in retrospective. Hey, uh, anything in closing? We've done this for about an hour. I don't want to keep you too long. But any uh, any closing thoughts? Um, I, 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 I feel we're in because what we have, and I guess people recognize this in other sovereigns across the globe, and I think in other countries recognize this in the green, is that you have somebody who embodies the concept of others before self. And mm. and ultimately maybe that is her most powerful gift to the nation. That that you know we value self-determinism as a society. People value the idea of control over their own lives to try and seize their own destiny. But actually it's immensely powerful to have somebody saying, I'm not interested in me, I'm interested in you, I'm interested in us. So I think we've been phenomenally lucky and not great. No, I agree. Yeah, you're right. Others before self is easy. We often focus on the other other stuff first. So I appreciate that. Hey, thank you for coming on, Matthew. I'd love to have you back on again and talk about more, more any of your books that, at any time. It's just so great to talk to someone who's uh, so versed in the knowledge or in the topic that they've written about. It's just fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And the book comes out in the States in September. Okay, in September, everybody, you can get it on pre-sales on Amazon. There's that link right there for sure. Go check it out. I know you're going to love it. All right, let me press this button. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much.